Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Good evening and welcome to another Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to take on a little bit more of a technical discussion than we have in the past. Not all of the the fun and games of video gaming in the gaming industry, but something that's definitely digital uh, and near and dear to my heart, which is contracts and contract law. Uh, And I think the best thing to do is just kind of to dive into this story because my guess is a number of you haven't heard it, haven't followed it. Uh, But this week, uh, Apple took the unusual step of uh, essentially asking Facebook and Google later on uh, to no longer use their enterprise services. Uh, And so I think we should just go into the articles and talk about what that means uh, and how I personally think uh, the contract that Apple is using to take these steps isn't as clear as it should be. Uh, Certainly Facebook and maybe also Google uh, weren't operating uh, under the spirit uh, of the contractual arrangements of the enterprise program, uh, but the language used in the contract is not terribly precise. Uh, And Facebook, as much as it might anger some in terms of what they're doing, we're going to talk about what that is, uh, doesn't appear to necessarily have violated uh, the actual Apple license agreement. And that's a problem essentially from the lawyer's side of things. Uh, And certainly Apple took the steps they did this week essentially as a public relations move, and not an unjustified one. Uh, And Facebook and Google immediately said they're mea culpas and said they shouldn't be doing this and they shouldn't be using the enterprise program in this manner. But I want to talk a little bit about how this happened because I'm fairly certain both Facebook and Google's counsel, their their internal lawyers, maybe their outside counsel, looked at the license agreement and said, yeah, we can probably do this under these terms, uh, even if it maybe isn't the intent of the license. So, Let's take a look at the articles. This one is from uh, TechCrunch uh, and is the, the main article that really kind of established this uh, minor scandal uh, this week. And it says, Facebook pays teens to install VPN that spies on them. Desperate for data on its competitors, Facebook has been secretly paying people to install a Facebook research VPN that lets the company suck in all of a user's phone and web activity similar to Facebook's Onavo Protect app that Apple banned in June and that was removed in August. Facebook sidesteps the App Store and rewards teenagers and adults to download the research app and give it root access to network traffic in what may be a violation of Apple policy, so the social network can decrypt and analyze their phone activity, a TechCrunch investigation confirms. Facebook admitted to TechCrunch it was running the research program to gather data on usage habits. Since 2016, Facebook has been paying users ages 13 to 35 up to $20 per month, plus referral fees, to sell their privacy by installing the iOS or Android Facebook research app. Facebook even asked users to screenshot their Amazon order history page as part of the research program. The program is administered through beta testing services Applause, Betabound, and Utest to cloak Facebook's involvement and is referred to in some documentation as Project Atlas a fitting name for Facebook's effort to map new trends and rivals around the globe. (coughs) Seven hours after this story was published, Facebook told TechCrunch it would shut down the iOS version of its research app in the wake of our report, but on Wednesday morning, an Apple spokesman confirmed that Facebook violated its policies and it had blocked Facebook's research app on Tuesday before the social network seemingly pulled it voluntarily. Um, So that's kind of the overall... Uh, concept of this story, and they go on to really kind of describe what's happening here uh, and Project Atlas. And Facebook did have a history of putting in the App Store a particular app uh, that went and got data in a fashion that Apple didn't like, and so they banned it from their App Store. Uh, But 
they Apple also runs uh, an enterprise program, and this enterprise program is essentially supposed to be used uh, by corporations, entities, uh, generally large ones, to essentially sideload uh, applications that are related to their business onto people's devices. Uh, so if you are an inventory logistics company and you've got a custom bit of software that you don't necessarily want to go through the App Store, it's not commercially viable, it's not useful for anybody, but your people, but you want your people to have it, you want you want them to be able to use it on their, their Apple uh, iOS devices, you can have a separate license with Apple that says, yeah, you can use this stuff internally. And that is what Facebook had been using essentially to sidestep uh, the App Store process because they essentially got in trouble from Apple for doing this kind of research. Uh, and TechCrunch talks about uh, all the bad things that this software can do, uh, and whether or not it's a good idea to sell it for $20 a month. And certainly the, the tenor of this article is that they don't think it's appropriate. They use words like exploit and secret and all these kinds of things. Uh, you know, from my perspective, and this is all kind of opinion stuff, this isn't law related, I, you know, it, it's, it's hard for me to sit here and say to someone else what the value of their data is. Uh, if you think it's worth it to give it to Facebook for $20 a month, that's great. I probably wouldn't for some number of thousands, uh, but everybody's going to differ on this. Uh, so if Facebook were otherwise following the contractual parameters that Apple sets out, uh, and if they were telling the person in general what it was that they were going to collect, and it certainly seems from this article that they do so, if we look at what they actually say here, it says, by installing the software, you're giving our client permission to collect data from your phone that will help them understand how you browse the internet, how you use the features and the apps you've installed. This means you're letting our client collect information such as which apps are on your phone, how and when you use them, data about your activities and content within those apps, as well as how other people interact with you or your content within those apps. You are also letting our client collect information about your internet browsing activity, including the websites you visit and data that is exchanged between your device and those websites and your use of other online services. There are some instances when our client will collect this information even where the app uses encryption or from within secure browser sessions. So that's actually what Applause, which is what Facebook's using to distribute this application, actually says. It, it, it tells people that it's going to have this high-level root access. It's going to see everything regardless of whether you're encrypting it or not. And they're going to pay you $20 a month for the right to get that data. Uh, and this article from TechCrunch finds that appalling and, and yells at Facebook and ultimately is what winds up getting this app pulled and actually entire enterprise certification policy from Apple pulled from Facebook, which prevents Facebook's employees from using those side loads uh, and has become a, a bit of an, a story on its own. Uh, and we go further down the article and it talks about just what they think that Apple violated here. So they have this framed under a subsection called flagrant defiance of Apple's rules. And it says, in response to TechCrunch's inquiry, a Facebook spokesperson confirmed it's running the program to learn how people use their phones and other services. The spokesperson told us, like many companies, we invite people to participate in research that helps us identify things we can be doing better. Since this research is aimed at helping Facebook understand how people use their mobile devices, we've provided extensive information about the type of data we collect and how they can participate. We don't share this information with others and people can stop participating at any time. Facebook spokesperson claimed that the Facebook research app was in line with Apple's enterprise certificate program, but didn't explain how in the face of evidence to the contrary. So now we're getting into the kind of normative statements. The, this article starts making legal judgments about what the contract says. And I, I sit here as a lawyer and I said, hey, that's pretty interesting. So let's see if we can find a copy of that uh, contract. And to their credit, TechCrunch put up a copy. That's what we're going to look at uh, in just a moment. And they've made these a a assertions in their article that Facebook isn't allowed to do this. Going on with the article, they said Facebook first launched its research app program in 2016. They tried to liken the program to a focus group and said Nielsen and Comscore run similar programs, yet neither of those ask people to install a VPN or provide root access to the network. The spokesperson confirmed the Facebook research program does recruit teens, but also other age groups from around the world. They claim that Inavo and Facebook research are separate programs, but admitted the same team supports both as an explanation for why their code was so similar. However, Facebook's claim that it doesn't violate Apple's enterprise certificate policy is directly contradicted by the terms of that policy. Those include that developers distribute provisioning profiles only to your employees and only in conjunction with your internal use applications for the purpose of developing and testing. The policy also states 
You may not use, distribute, or otherwise make your internal use applications available to your customers unless under direct supervision of employees or on company premises. Given Facebook customers are using the enterprise certificate powered app without supervision, it appears Facebook is in violation. So that's the paragraph I really wanted to focus on because it makes a number of fairly simple errors in interpreting what the contract actually says. Now, some of those errors are interesting because they're actually deliberately obfuscating the, uh, the actual language that's in the license to make their point better. And this is one of those things that I think journalists of all stripes could do a better job of. And to, pre to present your argument as strongly as possible, you need to include the stuff that maybe doesn't go towards your premises. So without further ado, let's take a look at the contract that is... Uh, at issue here. And so we're going to go to that tab right this second. And we see it is called the Apple Developer Enterprise Program License Agreement. We also see how TechCrunch has described this. This is their link. And they say Apple policy prohibits distributing enterprise certificate apps to non-employees. But as we see when we go through this contract, that's not really at all what it does. Although it certainly seems to be conceptually the intent, the spirit of the contract. So we see a couple of things here that don't really have legal operation. They don't actually bind anybody. They don't set rights or obligations of the parties, but they are informative of what is the intent of the contract. And in this particular contract, we see right at the top that under the title to the contract, they say for in-house internal use applications. Now, both of those terms are not capitalized. They aren't defined. They are essentially read to have the meaning that one would under kind of common understanding ascribe to them. So we think in-house, it means uh, internal to the business operations of the company, internal use you, it means something for the company, something that, that helps the company out. Uh, but I think a, a broad reading, certainly, of what a Facebook research app does, or as we'll see in just a minute, what a Google research app does, is designed to help the company. They're, they're looking to gain some kind of advantage, some kind of foothold in what their company operations are, uh, and whether or not that's directly working on something uh, as simple as inventory logistics or otherwise trying to survey the internet to figure out uh, when to buy WhatsApp uh, or what uh, the trends are or how they should be modifying their own software to capitalize on those trends, I certainly think is a gray area that the Facebooks and the Googles of the world could argue is well within the parameters of internal use for what they are, uh, which is global multinational data companies. Uh, but outside of that, we start to get into what the contract actually does. Uh, and so we've got a lot of things that say you're accepting the agreement. We've got a number of definitions that we are definitely going to come back to because it's in the definitions where all of this interesting stuff lay and where some of the ambiguity in what Apple is doing here uh, is really uh, comes to the fore. Uh, but where we always go when we look at a contract like this, which is a license for software use, is we, we try to find the first operative provision. And that's the license that goes from the company that owns the software, that owns the network, that owns the rights. And they license a third party. They license another person, in this case, Facebook, to use something, to use one of their rights, to use one of their software pieces, to use their network, to use their infrastructure. And here we find that in section two. And it says internal use license and restrictions subject to the terms and conditions of this agreement. Apple hereby grants you, Facebook, during the term, which is however long you keep paying them and however long the contract is in effect, a limited, non-exclusive, personal, revocable, non-sublicensable, and non-transferable license to, which is a big, long legal sentence for, here is a license that you get. It's not exclusive to you, so we can give it to other people. Google can also have this at the same time you do Facebook. It's personal to you. You can't sublicense it. You can't assign it to someone else. This is your license. And... Here's what you can do with it. You can install a reasonable number of copies of the Apple software, which if we go back up to the definitions, this one isn't as important. Uh, it's essentially the Apple software development kits, the stuff that goes with Apple to make apps. Uh, and so you can install those on Apple branded computers that are owned or controlled by you to be used internally by you. Again, lowercase i. And I think one of the problems with this contract is they don't really define internally. Uh, or your authorized developers for the sole purpose of developing or testing your covered products, these apps that you're going to make, except as otherwise expressly permitted in this agreement. So the first thing you can do is you can put our software development kits on your computers uh, or on computers that are used by your authorized developers, which can be contractors that can be outside your, uh, your enterprise to make these things. The, the second thing you can do, which is B, you can make and distribute a reasonable number of copies of the documentation to authorized developers for their internal use only and for the sole purpose of developing or testing your covered products. 
except as otherwise expressly permitted in this agreement. So the first one is you can distribute Apple software. The second one is you can distribute our manuals, our instruction books, the documentation that goes with that Apple software to help them make things, to help them understand the code base, to understand the engines, whatever it is that they're doing to help them understand how to use the software development kit. So that's A and B. We get to C. Install provisioning profiles on each of your authorized test units up to the number of authorized test units that you have acquired licenses for to be used internally by you or your authorized developers for the sole purpose of developing and testing your covered products, except as otherwise expressly permitted in this agreement. So let's break that down a little bit. Provisioning profiles is an interesting term, and it's one that isn't used in all software licenses. It's, it seems to be at least somewhat unique to the Apple agreement here, but they define provisioning profiles as follows. It means the files, including applicable entitlements or other identifiers, that are provided by Apple for use by you in connection with your internal use application development and testing and limited distribution of your internal use applications as permitted here under. So that's the stuff. That's essentially how you distribute your internal use applications, which are for uh, no better way to say for this purpose, they're your apps. So you make a little box that's going to go on somebody's phone. It's going to slide onto their deck. And it's called in this document, an internal use application as permitted here under. So the provisioning profiles are what you want to keep your eye on when we're looking at what's permitted under these licenses. So C is you can give those provisioning profiles to your authorized test units uh, so that people can test your covered products. This isn't use in operation. This isn't actually counting up that inventory. This is making sure it works. It does what it's supposed to do. We get to D as in dog. Distribute provisioning profiles only to your employees and only in conjunction with your internal use applications for the purpose of developing and testing your internal use applications. Now, if you remember, this is the provision that TechCrunch cited as being the only thing that you could do. Now, outside of the fact that they have ignored the rest of the license rights so far, and we haven't actually gotten to the one that the Facebook and Googles of the world would probably use in order to comply or claim compliance with this license, we can see that this is specifically targeted at developing and testing, not actual use of the application. So sure, you have to limit it to your employees, the people that you have actually hired and are employed by you and generally are going to be on site and operating at your headquarters or otherwise. You can only distribute these provisioning profiles to your employees for that purpose, development and testing. But again, that's only D and this goes down to G. E is an elephant. Distribute provisioning profiles only to your employees and or permitted users. So remember that term, permitted users, because it's going to be very, very important. In conjunction with your deployment of your internal use applications on deployment devices for internal use by your employees and or permitted users. So E is the big one. The rest of the ones that we've read so far, A, B, C, and D, are really about testing. They're about creating the application and they're about testing it to make sure it works. When we get to E, it says you can distribute these things to your employees and permitted users. Those are two separate categories. So it means something other than employees or else it doesn't have any meaning in the contract. So we're definitely gonna to wanna to go up and look at that definition to understand what it means. So let's do that right now. We scroll up and we see that permitted users means employees, but it also means contractors of your permitted entity who have written and binding agreements with you or your permitted entity to protect your internal use application from unauthorized use in accordance with the terms of this agreement. So permitted users, as it stands just in that definition, is essentially all of your employees and everybody that has a contract with you. So long as as part of that contract, you have them sign something that says essentially they will keep this application as quiet and as confidential as you are required to keep it as an entity in terms of this agreement with, with Apple. So in general, as long as Facebook onboarded someone uh, and paid them money, they have a pretty significant claim that they are essentially contractors of the entity. They're cheap contractors. You know, they're getting paid $240 a year or what have you, uh, but they are under contract of the, uh, of the company. And as long as they took the right steps to have them onboarded with something that says, hey, you're going to keep this as quiet as is otherwise required in this document. And there's really no reason to think that they didn't do that. Um, then they could be classified as permitted users. And under E of the 2.1 license that we just talked about, just from those definitions, and we haven't looked at some other stuff that kind of confounds this, and it's really where the ambiguity comes in, just under the definitions that we've read, 
Google or Facebook should be able to distribute provisioning profiles to them as permitted users in conjunction with deployment of the internal use applications. But of course, one of the definitions we haven't looked at, and we're going to look at it last, is the definition of internal use applications because that's where things get a little more complicated. But let's take a look at F. Uh, allow your customers to use your internal use applications on deployment devices, but only on your physical premises and on your, on your permitted entity's physical premises or in other locations, provided all such uses under the direct supervision and physical control of your employees or permitted users. So again, this is a license that each category is separate. These are all different things that you can do. So you could allow customers to use your internal use applications. And we could talk about the definition of customers and how that also creates ambiguity here, but only if it is essentially under the control of an employee or what we're really focusing on because we're talking about non-employees, permitted users, which we think incorporates the concept of contractor because lowercase c contractor is actually used in the contract. So every time we see permitted users, we have to be thinking this might be the people that we're talking about that Facebook is charged with giving these apps to in violation uh, of this license. And then it says, uh, the last one is you can incorporate the Apple certificates, the, the things that uh, certify that they are proper apps uh, issued to you pursuant to this agreement for purposes of digitally signing your internal use applications. Uh, and so that's what we've got. We've got a, a set of licenses and this license goes on for 50 pages. It talks about what you have to say about consent, that you have to comply with laws, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, but none of those are what Facebook or Google is charged with violating. They're essentially charged with violating uh, the license here by giving it to other people that they consider that Apple considers uh, to be customers or otherwise outside of the internal use matrix that they tried to set forth here. So again, we want to focus on E, distribute provisioning profiles to your employees and or permitted users in conjunction with your deployment of your internal use applications on deployment devices. So let's take a look at internal use applications because that's really where the fun lives here. So an internal use application is once again, the apps that we're talking about, the actual things that do something. In this case, Facebook research is the internal use application. It means a software program, including extensions, media, and libraries that are enclosed in a single software bundle that is developed by you on a custom basis for your own business purposes. So do we meet that when we're talking about Facebook research? It was developed by Facebook, undoubtedly. It seems to be customized. It doesn't seem to be based on anything else. Uh, you could get into an argument that it's essentially based on the Onavo Protect uh, kind of code, and maybe that would be a fight uh, worth having. But that also wasn't brought up in, in what Apple claimed was the problem with what Facebook did here. Uh, for specific use with an Apple-branded product running iOS, watchOS, tvOS, and or macOS, an Apple uh, piece of equipment, as applicable and solely for internal use by your employees or permitted users, or is otherwise expressly permitted in section 2.1F. So we've got a couple of things that are required here. It needs to be custom made. It needs to be for your own business purposes. And I don't think anybody would accuse Facebook of making Facebook research to the advantage of somebody else. It's not selling it. Uh, it's not trying to make other people money. It's trying to make Facebook money and it's paying for the privilege. It's making these people contractors of a sort. Uh, and it's solely for internal use by your employees or permitted users. We've already talked about the fact that these people can probably fit under the umbrella of permitted users. Question is, is this internal use? And unfortunately, the contract drafters here didn't really define it. Uh, I certainly think internal use can mean internal to Facebook. This was always intended, Facebook research, to benefit Facebook. It was always intended to make their business better, to give them opportunities to make more money in the marketplace. And you can think of what they are doing as nefarious as you like. I'm not sure that it violates this particular provision. But ah, we get to the next sentence of the internal use application definition. Except as otherwise expressly permitted herein. So take that proviso and put it in your back pocket because that's going to be important. Specifically excluded from internal use applications are any programs or applications that may be used, distributed, or otherwise made available to other companies, contractors, except for contractors who are developing the internal use application for you on a custom basis and therefore need to use or have access to such application, distributors, vendors, resellers, end users, or members of the general public. For the sake of clarity, internal use applications do not include third-party applications, even if some customization has been done. So 
we have a bunch of different concepts here. But the main one is they're trying to say internal use applications don't count for contractors, which is what we just said is the bucket that these people can probably best fall into. It also says it doesn't include third-party applications even if some customization has been done. So Apple might be able to claim that the Onavo history of the Facebook research app also prevents it from being considered an internal use application. I'm not sure that's the strongest argument. And that's also kind of something is hinted at by the fact that Apple didn't wind up using it as their argument. Uh, But at the beginning of that sentence, it says, except as otherwise expressly permitted herein, which Uh, If you're a lawyer or if you're a contract drafter, tends to be kind of a a cough. It tends to be the kind of um or huh or uh of contract drafting because you don't want to have ambiguities. You don't want to have provisions that you write over a long period of time. This is a 51-page agreement. Uh, Conflict with each other in ways that you can't fully anticipate or you can't fully understand when you are writing this kind of 50-page document. So sometimes when you're drafting, you say, all right, I'm writing this provision in, I'm writing this restriction in, but I want to say, hey, unless we say otherwise somewhere else that I'm not thinking of here, uh, this is going to apply. But in this particular circumstance, it really screws up being able to understand what's happening here. So we have a couple of expressly permitted. Remember, in the first part of the internal use application definition, we say, Uh, It means all these things uh, solely for internal use by your employees or permitted users or is otherwise expressly permitted in Section 2.1F. And 2.1F, if you don't remember exactly, is the provision that talks about allowing customers to use something so long as uh, the the, uh, application is under the physical control of an employee or permitted user. And the permitted user's definition doesn't have all of this Uh, stuff that says it doesn't count for contractors, it doesn't count for distributors and vendors. Permitted users is a broader category, and maybe it should have these restrictions, and it might be something that Apple tries to tie up as they examine their contracts and figure out how they were able to be taken advantage of by Facebook and Google. Uh, But outside of that, we've got this provision here that says, uh, it except is otherwise expressly permitted herein, all of this stuff is going to apply, that internal use application doesn't count for contractors, doesn't count for distributors. And one of the things that a lawyer has to do, and if Facebook or Google wanted to fight this, and they don't, uh, because the, the negative public uh, uh, relations ramifications of fighting it, TechCrunch called them out, uh, immediate negative uh, public opinion came out against Facebook, against Google. But if they wanted to fight this, would you say that 2.1e, which all it says is you have the license to distribute provisioning profiles to your employees and permitted users in conjunction with your deployment of internal use applications for internal use by your employees and our permitted users. Is that the kind of right, the kind of license right that is an accept as expressly permitted herein? Do we need to take into account the definition of internal use application as saying something other than this? Now, it, it becomes a sense, uh, an end, endlessly recursive function because internal use application is used in the license right and is also defined to have those kinds of restrictions. So I, ideally, it wouldn't do this. And that's where this ambiguity comes from is does the fact that it has this kind of exception prevent the use that Facebook and Google have intended for it, even though permitted users are otherwise allowed to have it? And in respect of that, does 2.1F come in and say, okay, even if, we, even if we fall outside of that rubric, can we use 2.1F to essentially say that you guys who are outside of Facebook are not only permitted users, you're also customers, you're both. And we're allowed to ha- allow customers to use our internal use applications on deployment devices if they're under the direct supervision and physical control of a permitted user. And since you're a contractor and you're a customer, because customers are folks that use Facebook technology, including the Facebook app and other things, if you've got both on it, can we just instead slide you under 2.1F and say, hey, you're a permitted user that's showing off the software to yourself. Uh, And these are the kinds of things that sound like silly arguments. They're angels on the head of a pin. This is what lawyers get paid the big bucks for. And I certainly think when I looked at this, when I read the TechCrunch article, I said, well, this contract is not at all remotely the slam dunk that they think it is. And if we go back to that article, we see Facebook's claim that it doesn't violate Apple's enterprise certificate is directly contradicted by the terms of that policy. Those include that developers distribute provisioning profiles only to your employees and in conjunction with your internal use applications for the purpose of developing and testing. 
Again, that's not what they should be focused on. That's the one earlier than E. That's the main distribution provision, the main license right, and also says you may not distribute to customers unless directly under the supervision of employees or on company premises. And you can see right there, they com they completely skip the concept of permitted users. So when they wrote this article, they saw the contract, obviously they linked the contract, and they ignored the entire kind of difficult part of legal analysis, which is you've got these conflated, conflicting definitions, and they just skipped the notion of permitted users entirely. They didn't even bring it up in their article. And as a lawyer, that's one of the things I really hate about these stories. They obviously want to drive clicks. They want to tell these stories. They want to make Facebook, in this particular instance, as villainous as possible. And I can respect that to some extent. I certainly would not personally be selling my data to Facebook under these apps. And to some extent, I think Facebook has made any number of footfalls in the past year in terms of keeping people's data safe and what they've said to Congress and things of that nature. But I think it's important, even if you're going to attack someone like Facebook and justifiably that you present the arguments, you present the evidence as specifically as you can, and you let people make these judgments on their own. Now, to TechCrunch's credit, they linked the enterprise certificate policy. That's the reason I can make this video. That's the reason I can talk about these things with you. And so I, I really do want to credit them for that because anytime you have an article like this, anytime you have an article that's discussing a judicial opinion or a court case or uh, even a, a criminal arrest, it's very much appreciated when the website or the article can otherwise link or, or point you in the direction of the primary source material so that you can do this kind of analysis. And I like doing this kind of thing. Uh, and I like putting up these kinds of videos, uh, but it does give me pause when I see someone write a paragraph like this, when I see them write three or four paragraphs like this that essentially ignore a lot of the language, a lot of the difficult questions that the contract presents. And so we see them go on and on from there. Facebook is bad. Facebook is bad. And we see the effects of that. Apple blocks Facebook from running its internal iOS apps. Facebook's internal iOS apps simply don't launch anymore. Uh, and this is an article from The Verge. Apple has shut down Facebook's ability to distribute internal iOS apps from early releases of the Facebook app to basic tools like a lunch menu. A person familiar with the situation tells The Verge that early versions of Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, and other pre-release dog food, beta, apps have stopped working, as have other employee apps like one for transportation. Facebook is treating this as a critical problem internally, we're told, as the affected apps simply don't launch on employees' phones anymore. The shutdown comes in response to news that Facebook has been using Apple's program for internal app distribution to track teenage customers with a research app. Uh, we go further on. This poses a huge issue for Facebook. While Apple provides other tools a company can use to install apps internally, Apple's enterprise program is the main solution for widely distributing internal apps and services. In an email, a Facebook spokesperson said, I can confirm that this affects our internal apps. And so this... TechCrunch article, which did skip a lot of the legal issues, did vilify Facebook in a very specific way, uh, had a major impact on the continuing corporate operations of Facebook. Uh, and Apple took this step on, at, at the bare minimum, a gray, a gray area kind of use case for their license. Uh, certainly without this kind of media look at what Facebook was doing, the normal kind of corporate operating procedure would be to send an email, to have a phone call with a tech giant like a Facebook, like a Google, and say, hey, you know, this wasn't the intent of the program. You really shouldn't be doing this. You know, please stop this uh, and we can go on about our lives. But because of the way TechCrunch reported this, because of what they'd done for the last couple of days, and we're going to look at the Google article right now, uh, which came out immediately after the Facebook article, Google will stop peddling a data collector through Apple's back door. It looks like Facebook was not the only one abusing Apple's system for distributing employee-only apps to sidestep the App Store and collect extensive data on users. Google has been running an app called ScreenWise Meter, which bears a strong resemblance to the app distributed by Facebook Research that has now been barred by Apple, TechCrunch has learned. And then they go on to describe that. It's kind of a, a similar setup. Uh, they say, unlike Facebook, Google is much more upfront about how its research data collection programs uh, work. Uh, it gives an option for a guest mode for when you don't want to have your traffic monitored, uh, et cetera, et cetera. An interesting part of the Google uh, kind of concept is that it, it doesn't appear that for the most part they get paid. I think there's a notion here in the article uh, somewhere that, oh, ScreenWise lets users earn gift cards for sideloading the VPN app. Uh, but it doesn't appear to have the same direct payment component, which 
essentially TechCrunch argues makes the, the Google concepting, the Google app better than the Facebook app. Uh, to me, the lawyer in me, the, the contract reader in me says, oh, that makes it much harder for you to claim that these users that you're giving the app to are contractors, uh, that it, it makes it much more difficult to fall under the exceptions that Facebook might have wanted to fall under under the enterprise license. And so I look at this and says Google has a weaker claim. Uh, but either way, Google self took it down and TechCrunch gives them credit. They say they did it in three hours instead of seven, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, the fact of the matter is uh, Apple uh, wound up blocking Facebook's enterprise usage. Uh, I, I believe that uh, they wound up blocking uh, Google's enterprise usage as well. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, whether or not you think this is right, whether or not you think uh, Google and Apple are right in what they are doing, um, the, the fact of the matter is the contract that Apple had in place was unclear on these things. And absolutely, Facebook or Google could have gone and asked about what the provisions mean. Uh, but they certainly were pushing the bounds of essentially asking for forgiveness instead of permission. But it's interesting to me as a lawyer who doesn't have a vested interest. I don't have stock in any of these companies. Uh, I don't really love the tech giants in general, uh, Google or Facebook or Apple, to be honest, in terms of how they operate on a regular basis. Uh, and to see this story presented as it has been on Twitter and on Reddit and on these various sites that I check out daily uh, is, I think, a one-sided. And I was very happy to see earlier today an article uh, in VentureBeat uh, by Jeremy Horwitz uh, that I'm also going to link in the description of this video that talks about this a little bit that talks about some of the stuff that we've talked about today, the odd reason Apple killed Facebook's and Google's usage research apps. Uh, and uh, it's an article I recommend checking out. Uh, and it, it goes on and talks about what Facebook was doing, what Google was doing, just as we've talked about in this video. And it says, was Apple acting heroically here? No. And while Facebook has deservedly taken heat recently for many offensive activities, disclosure, I and members of my family have stopped using the service, this particular situation wasn't as cut and dried as good finally prevailing over evil. Similar to the Capone situation, he, he makes a uh, metaphor to Al Capone being taken down for tax evasion earlier in the article. Facebook's data gathering app wasn't shut down because it was tangibly hurting or ripping off innocent people, but rather because it arguably, note the word arguably, violated either the word or spirit of Apple's enterprise developer agreement. Unlike Apple's standard developer agreement, which covers apps distributed to consumers, the enterprise agreement covers apps distributed to employees and contractors. Near the beginning of the enterprise document, Apple directly tells developers, this program is for internal use custom applications that are developed by you for your specific business purposes and only for use by your employees and in limited cases by certain other parties as set forth herein. And we talked about that. We talked about the fact that permitted users is a class that is separated from employees, that the license specifically contemplates that somebody other than just your employees have the rights to use most things, that, that the license extends to this class of other people that includes contractors. And the way their definitions work, it's very unclear how broad that is supposed to be. But certainly there is a tangible, legitimate argument to be made that if I'm paying somebody $20 a month, they're a contractor of mine, and they should have the rights that this contract contemplates. And this article goes on to discuss that. Uh, and this author appears to have some kind of lawyer background. It says, putting my dusty intellectual property lawyer hat back on, I see two core issues here. First, were these apps for the developer's internal use? Second, were these developers distributing these apps to employees, contractors, or consumers? Uh, notwithstanding Apple's statement and Google's apology, my take is that both answers are gray rather than black or white. Apple would have had zero room to complain if the only people using these apps were employees sitting in Google's offices. Instead, they were paid panelists, arguably limited purpose contractors, providing data solely for the developer's research purposes and not locked in Google's building. And we talked that the, the Google app is not as clear in terms of the contractor argument as the Facebook one, at least as it's described in TechCrunch. If they had another kind of payment going on with the Google app, then they would have the same kind of defenses that Facebook did. This article goes on to say that's completely normal in the technology R&D world. As Apple's famous lost at a bar iPhone situation 4 revealed, uh, iPhone 4 situation revealed, even the most secretive companies don't conduct all their research and testing indoors at offices. There are plenty of valid and legal reasons to gather data in multiple locations across a geographic area and in public, particularly when a developer is trying to understand real world app usage habits. Now, it's not really clear whether Facebook and Google should really be distributing small panel research apps to the broad base of consumers in the iOS app store, but for the time being, that appears to be their only option. 
assuming, of course, that their data collection isn't running afoul of other Apple developer rules, such as privacy considerations. But again, we talked about that as well. That's not what they were brought up on. So we have no reason to believe that Apple has a specific problem with the consent requirements or any other compliance requirements or the way the app actually works. They essentially just struck it down for being distributed in this manner to people that they felt were outside of the rubric of permitted users or employees. And essentially, Facebook and Google rolled over and said, okay. Uh, they say, in my fear, it's not fair to, fit, to tar Facebook and Google with the same brush. At this point, it's almost inconceivable that people wouldn't know that Google was collecting data about them when it uses their services. It's frankly more surprising that Google actually offered to pay ScreenWise Meter users for their data, given that it has free access to more user information than any other company in the world. But I also have deep concerns about Apple's ability to threaten use of a company crippling tool in a situation like this. But if there's any good news here, it's that the company hasn't used its kill switch apart from sketchy situations. And that's all I'll read from the article. I do recommend you you click on it. It's an interesting article. It's really well written. Uh, But that's what I wanted to get to, which is this notion of living at a company's largesse. And this is going to come up in some other kind of video game focused conversations that we have specifically about the Steam and Epic Game Store. But there is a notion that some folks have that it's okay to essentially allow a corporation to give you soft rights. Uh, to say, hey, it's okay as long as we don't use this weapon against you uh, or we don't take those rights away. Uh, And I think that's where you really start to get into problems. Right now, Apple is essentially claiming that this isn't okay, but they didn't really write the license to say that. And I think, uh, in all likelihood, Apple's going to look at their contracts. They're going to look at commentary like this from VentureBeat and from elsewhere. And they're going to say, okay, we need to clean up some of this stuff. Because I don't think anybody, Facebook and Google included, think that this was the intent of the Apple program, uh, that uh, Facebook and Google were essentially operating in the vagaries, in the gray area that appear to have been allowed in the corners, uh, in the loopholes of the way the Apple Enterprise license worked. And Apple can clean that up. They can make an amendment to the next set of terms when there's a renewal on that license. They can, they can clean that up without difficulty. But for right now, I do think that they essentially used a weapon against Facebook uh, in particular, because they have a continuing in institutional kind of animosity between Apple and Facebook that has continued for some period of time. And essentially, Google got caught in the wash on this. The, the Google app, one thing I didn't say is it's been around a lot longer than the Facebook app. And essentially, when TechCrunch was making its Facebook case, uh, it, it started looking into other apps, found this Google app, and Google said, okay will take it down, but it's been in operation for much longer than the Facebook research app had uh, and essentially got uh, collateral damage in Apple's fight against uh, Facebook. Uh, But I think it's something to be worried about uh, when you've got a a position like that where if a company is going to operate outside its license and it's going to do these kinds of things, uh, probably Facebook should have fought them a little bit more Uh, But the situation was such that the public relations nightmare probably wasn't worth it. And when you've got those kinds of situations, when Apple can cast itself as the white hat and say, we're taking down the evil Facebook data collectors who are secretly collecting your data from your teenagers, uh, that becomes a problem from a kind of corporate governance and a contractual standpoint, uh, because they are uh, essentially allowed to act in an extra contractual capacity. And I think that's something that should be focused on a little more. And it's why I wanted to take a deep dive with you uh, through the contract terms to really talk about where those ambiguities lie. Um, And so that's my video for tonight. Uh, If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any feedback, I am always interested getting it. I love talking about this stuff. I think the fact that the three biggest tech giants in the United States are essentially going to war with each other this week is enormously fascinating. And the fact that the one side that is really going to war the most doesn't really have the contractual backing that they might think that they have uh, makes it even more fascinating. Uh, And so that's why I wanted to talk to you about it this week. If you have any comments on that, if you have any notions about uh, why I might be wrong, uh, provisions that you've read in the contract that suggest something else, I'd love to have those discussions as well. And again, the one thing I would point out here is I'm no big fan of Facebook. I'm no big fan of Google. Uh, I don't love the data collection that they're doing. I would never sign up for these programs. I don't have an Alexa. I don't have things that can listen to me from these companies in my home. So it's a matter of uh, really reading the contracts. That's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from a kind of neutral perspective as to what those provisions say and who's in the right and who's in the wrong. Uh, Otherwise, I don't really have a problem with Apple kicking Facebook off their system. Uh, But if they do that, I'd rather they have the contractual right to do that, that they drafted for those rights and not collected money uh, from Facebook and from Google uh, and then essentially turned the switch off uh, for reasons that are at bare minimum ambiguous. 
Uh, so again, if you have comments on that, please leave them. If you like this video, please like, please subscribe to the channel. I'm doing these kinds of videos essentially all the time now. Uh, we've got the pipeline working, so I'm doing a lot of videos on video games. I'm doing a lot of videos on uh, the uh, information technology and video game industry in general, uh, as well as uh, certain other topics like uh, sports and, and games and board games and things of that nature, rule sets, uh, and a lot of contracts. So if you do like talking about contracts, if you like talking about messaging uh, in respect of uh, crisis management and crisis messaging, I did a couple of those for Nintendo's announcement of Metroid Prime. Uh, and, and Anthem from Bioware and things of that nature. Please do check it out. Uh, and please do follow me on uh, Twitter at Hoaglaw. Uh, and otherwise, thank you so very much for watching. <laughs>